the first number one I had was with Trey songs wow. as a writer. Yeah. So money's different. <laughs> sure. Well, yeah, I guess that'd be a, a first change. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, I'm, but honestly, that change didn't come until nine months. So, right. You know, okay. Wow. So it'll, it'll hit. And then everybody's like, you're number one. How does it feel? It's like, I'm still broke. I'm <laughs> yeah. still Waiting on that check. <laughs> Welcome back to Inner Sleeve. It's episode number 45 right here on Sound Mojo. I'm Cassius Morris, Frank Pavan and Joe Pacheco checking in from all the way in Montreal, Quebec. How's it going over there, guys? Doing good, my man. How are you doing? I mean, I, I want to not complain about the upcoming snow that we're going to have, but I feel like it's almost unavoidable. I mean, I, I got to say what's on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah the, weather's, the weather is getting cold. The weather is yeah, getting honestly, cold. Man. I think we're going to be talking about it more and more as every show uh, gets introduced. But what can you do? That's uh, what part of what happens when you're ca Canadian. So We will get through one intro eventually without mentioning it. We had some awesome R&B songwriting talk with the one and only Kevin Ross, um, an awesome, awesome singer-songwriter. And he actually started off his career on the writing side of things, as I mentioned. So we're going to delve into an entirely different side of the music business, as we always try to do, as well as covering the artist's perspective. But before we do that, we have a little bit of housekeeping we want to get through off the top here. Of course, um, just get right into it. Thank you to all of you for making us hit the 24,000 subscriber plateau. Just 1,000 more to 25, the road to 25. Um, yes. So a big thanks for that. Thank for, you. For, for making the channel hit 24K. That's a big thanks from uh, the three of us. Uh, other things to mention is, of course, as usual, check the links down below. Check out if any of the merchandise that we've got going. Of course, we've got nice hoodies. We've got nice crew necks and, and all that good stuff. Check it out. If anything suits your, tickles your fancy, support the channel that way. For those of you on the audio listening platforms, follow like, leave a comment, come over to the YouTube channel, uh, partake in the beautiful music house that is Sound Mojo, and uh, Joe keeps you all very occupied with nice polls and questions and all that on a daily basis. So we like to keep it active here around, uh, around Sound Mojo. The most exciting thing happening in music right now is we're ramping up to the release of Get Back, the Disney Plus three-part special about the Beatles. And if you guys missed this, this is actually restored footage back when they were doing Let It Be, the album. It shows them inside the studio working on this, and it's directed by Peter Jackson. I mean, guys, could it get any better than this when it comes to like a little Beatles treasure? I feel like this, this might be the pinnacle here. Yeah, totally, man. I mean, <clears throat> this is like the treasure trove 50 years later, uh, you know, and then the top of Cherry is like, it's Peter Jackson. You know, he doesn't skimp on anything. And that's what I love about it. That's why I'm excited about it. Get this, guys. I can guarantee you, I'm not an insider in this, but I can guarantee you that you will enjoy this and you will fall in love with it and fall in love with not only the content, but the way Peter Jackson works, because... In 2018, he made a very underrated film called They Shall Not Grow Old. And that was repurposed and restored footage from World War I. That's it. Uh, mm. And I'm kind of a history buff. I enjoy this type of thing and, and a buddy of mine as well. So the second I saw that being promoted, They Shall Not Grow Old, man, I can't believe it was already 2018. But I, I went to theaters to watch this. That's how, that's how interested I was in it. And it was terrific. It blew everyone's wow. hats off. And this is... Uh, footage that was that was essentially 100 years old, right? Well, 1914 yeah. and 1918. That's the footage he was using. So the footage is already going to be better uh, for this one, right? Because exactly. we're moving, we're fast forwarding 40, 50 years to to when this was uh, the, the the original footage was, was recorded. And he did a phenomenal job with They Shall Not Grow Old, taking footage from the Imperial War Museum in London, and uh, you know, like the frame rate and or, uh, excuse me, yeah, that, is that the right? I think that's what it was. That mm -hmm. it, you know, he he brings everything almost to a modern day camera, the speed in which all the frames are, are working at. So he did an awesome job of bringing World War One soldiers to life in 2018. I can guarantee you this next one uh, will be terrific. You just have to look at the trailer, uh, which we're going to be showing here a couple of clips on screen where look how good it looks. It just looks fantastic. It doesn't look like it was touched up. That's the vibe. You know what I mean? It doesn't look like somebody worked yeah. on this. It looks like this is how it was. And then, you know, and the audio as well is just like, oh, wow, we're going to get to hear this like, stuff. We're just sorry to cut you off. I'm so I'm so excited for this because like what you were talking about, how Peter Jackson is super meticulous. He doesn't skip over anything. 
uh, just to give you a, maybe a t an idea of the, the level of detail he'll go into this film, for the Sh They Shall Now Grow Old uh, film, there was obviously footage, but audio wasn't at an elite level back then, right? So it was mm. very broken, and if not, there was none. Yeah. So what he did, to the level of extent that he and his team went to, was he found out which military division such rank, uh, such uh, officers and soldiers were from, and then he he documented where those divisions were uh, <laughs> were plucked from in England, what parts of England they were plucked from, and the voice actors were from those parts of England, so that they wow. would best replicate yeah. the the accents. That so they, they're uh, that dubbing the it essentially with new audio. That's insane. Yes. Yeah. So, anyways, uh, and and just watching the the, the trailer for, for the, this upcoming documentary or whatever you want to call it, film. Um, it really makes you feel like you're there, right? Like it makes you feel wow. like you're having it's, those conversations with them, right? And the with the Beatles. I mean, it's it's like there's yeah. more than 150 hours of unheard audio, right? And like it's been locked for 50 years, you know. And what's cool is like I'm such a geek uh, in terms of being in the studio and wanting to see how when they're tracking, when they're recording, or how they came up with certain parts. So this, and then like to have this, like I don't know, I'm just super excited, man. Oh, and like yeah, I just can't wait. Just this might we, be it, though. Do you think that this is because I mean, how many hours of unreleased Beatles stuff can we have if we've just unearthed fifty-seven hours? This could be nearing the end of the well. One hundred fifty yeah. hmm. unheard audio. Maybe it's not video. Okay. Uh, maybe that, not that much. But and what's really cool is <clears throat> we're gonna get to see finally the last performance at uh, that famous uh, rooftop performance you know, mm. in its entirety in there. So mm. that's what's more than just I, one I or two clips. Says, Rooftop concert, yeah. Uh, as and well as the songs. fact that this is a three-part series, that's interesting too. Like how long are each, do we know how long each of the, seri the series are going to be? I don't know the exact runtime. I would assume over an hour each. And that's yeah. one of the good things about this is that they could have just tried to condense it into like an hour and a half. They're actually letting that's, this all go out there, which is nice. But that's yeah. Peter Jackson for you, man. Because even The Hobbit, right, could have been one book. It was one book, I mean, but they split it into three films. Lord of the yeah. Rings, he didn't spare any expense mm. uh, or, or work. And this, like, they do say here, for the first time in its entirety, the Beatles' last live performance as a group. So it's going to be its entirety. That's at least, I don't Huge know how long that concert And for, for just music fans in general, like, obviously, you think back to iconic top five bands of all time, the Beatles are in majority of everyone's yeah. list. So when something like this comes out, you're, you're, you know there's going to be eyeballs. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Speaking of the Beatles... You know, we wanted to mention our friend uh, Dre the Music Man, who this week, publishing tomorrow technically, uh, is a video on uh, McCartney 321, which is another, uh, mm. I think it's a Disney Plus again. Um, uh, uh, well, I was going to say. This. Yeah, I'm stuck here. Help me out, somebody. A biopic? Uh, <laughs> no, just like, um, uh, what did they call this? Like uh, a sh uh, uh, series. There you okay. go, series, the <laughs> Disney Plus series, jeez. Uh, yeah, so that, that he, he breaks that down, and, uh, and it's the same thing. It's with Rick Rubin, so another legend sitting okay. in a room, just the two of them, black and white, going over Beatles, soloing bass lines, soloing uh, certain parts of the songs. So you really get to hear, like, you know, that the bass line was like, oh, it's not perfect, but, like, it works in the song, you know? So people are really going to... We're, we're spoiled, man, for content and, like, this kind of stuff. Like, you could only dream of this when I was a kid, right? Now mm. we're, like, we're getting it, you know? So, yeah, Very check out that video. Very exciting stuff. Definitely check out that video by Dre the Music Man. McCartney, 3 to 1. Dre is the man, and uh, definitely look forward to having him back on this show at some point soon. We'll, we'll definitely keep in touch with everybody in the Sound Mojo circle here. Don't act like We did have one little news tidbit before we jump into some trivia and on this day. Now, this was a personal story that I plucked because I thought it was kind of interesting. Gene Simmons had vowed to leave California this summer in 2021. He, in fact, did leave and he bought a massive $16 million estate uh, in the Las Vegas Hills. Bro, this thing's more than an estate. It's a compound. Dude, I, th this is, it's like an island if it wasn't detached from land. Um, now, after just a month in this beautiful sprawling compound, Gene is selling the property and moving to Washington now. 
So my only question is, what do you guys think sparked this one month move to Nevada after being such a champion of it? I think uh, Nevada is just okay. too dry for the, the sticking out tongue. You know, you can't have his tongue sticking out. <laughs> it shriveled his tongue a little That's bit. That's it. He said, I got to get out of there. You needed, you needed more house. You know? <laughs> Honestly, man. And if you guys, we'll, we'll probably show a couple pictures of this house here. It's crazy to me because this seems like the type of house that you would have at the top of your success. Like even if you look at his old place, very, a lot more regal, a lot more older class and elegance to it. This looks like a place that you would have like a hip hop rap party. And I just picture Gene waking up in his onesie pajamas, just having a <laughs> cup of tea or coffee. I mean, that's luxury folks, you know? Yeah, totally. I mean, this is so like on just to level. to understand his his um, his moving pattern. It was L.A. to Nevada for a short brief time, then Nevada to Washington, Washington State, or or Washington D.C. Washington State, apparently. Okay. Um, so he's going to be living somewhere out there. And I think the taxes thing was the reason that he was leaving California, Joe. So mm -hmm. I'd be That's, very curious well, to find out. There was a Many, big exodus of, uh, you know, Joe Rogan and company and all those people leaving Musk. for tax reasons, but going to Texas, right? Yeah. Exactly. Musk. How exactly. crazy would it be if, if uh, Simmons now relocates to Austin, Texas and uh, goes after well, the Chappelle, Joe Rogan Chappelle, I think, way. is there too, Wouldn't be right, Dave Chappelle? So it's like, yeah, yeah. I, I guess it's the new tax haven. Back when I was younger, all the musicians, the superstars would move to the UK, right? Like uh, oh. for, for tax evasion, you know, I'm speculating here, but like, yeah, you know, that's, that was the thing, you know, you'd move to the UK and then like, that's why I think, you know, artists like Brian Adams, a lot of them relocated all there, right? For tax reasons. Okay. I guess that would probably have the most to do with it. So, hey, shout out to these guys. If, if you know, they have uh, that 1% tax issue, I definitely cannot relate. <laughs> so I'll let you know when I can hopefully one day relate to that. So now we wanted to switch it up a little bit. If you guys have been watching the show recently, you know that I've been getting my butt handed to me in trivia every single week, and I figured we would turn the tables. This week, I'm going to give Frank and Joe a bit of trivia. So guys, are you ready for this round? Because I mean, I pulled out all the stops for this here. Let's go. Just be, just be gentle. <laughs> just be gentle. Okay. So a little bit of inner sleeve trivia, and we went across a bunch of genres for this. Start off with the softball. Before reaching mainstream success, Cardi B starred on what reality TV show? Ah, uh, shit. I only know one. I've that seen to this head. one too, Is man. Jersey Shore? No. Cardi B, <laughs> okay. bro. I don't watch TV, bro. <laughs> Cardi B. It's not Snooki. Um, oh, is it uh, is it the show with uh, Nick Cannon there that they you know the the rap could show? be well, I forget be. what it's called what's it called is that your final guess it's America's as good of a guess as I got right now world. that would be your guess um, I don't it? think it's I don't think it's the the one that I'm referring to with Nick Cannon but that'll be my guess okay you're both wrong unfortunately the answer is love and hip hop okay, okay. Um, which is definitely Definitely not the uh, hottest destination in the hip hop totem pole, but that's where she started and look at her now. You gotta start somewhere, yeah. it's fine, all right. Okay, so we got a draw right now. This might be a little better. So what iconic Nashville club does Garth Brooks call, quote, the beginning and the Mecca, the end? Nashville. A and Nashville iconic club? Iconic Nashville club. So it's like an actual, it's like a nightclub, it's like a bar? It is. It is a venue. It's a venue. Okay, I was gonna say the the, old, the Grand Ole Opry or something like that. And I wish I had options for you guys, but this is gonna have to be a little tougher. So you're saying the Grand Ole Opry? I have two. I only it's because only because I know them, right? We just did the Nashville video, so that's I, why I wanted to put yeah, this one in. There's either that or the Bluebird Cafe or something like that. I'm not sure. So I'll, I'll go with the Opry. I know zero venues in all of Nashville, so I have no guess here. Okay, Joe, you are correct. It's the Bluebird Cafe. There you go. That's a very, very good. I love how it just kind of came at, like into, from the woodwork of your mind. You're like, I might throw that in there, and you ended up being yeah, but, right. But I ended up going with the Opry, so I don't know. We'll see. Okay, I guess I, at, least well, I, at, least, at least I got into ballpark. Hey, I'll withhold the point if you want it. I mean, it doesn't make me <laughs> yeah, look yeah, any please, worse. Please, please. No. Fair is fair. Fair is fair. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. Okay. One nothing, Joe. One nothing, Joe. One nothing, Joe. Okay. George Harrison wrote what song for Eric Clapton? about Clapton's Sweet Tooth. Beatles song written about a sweet tooth. Wow, I suck. Hmm. Yeah, Joe, this is more of a, 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 sure a telling sign of your... I'm gonna this is more a hit to, of a hit to your music knowledge than mine. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, what 
what song? I know there was a Clapton and I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay, we don't we we don't know. No clue. The Allegedly. answer is Savoy Truffle. Okay, good. See, I didn't know that Savoy one. Savoy <laughs> Truffle, which I always thought was more of a perverse song, but truffle. I guess it is uh, exactly how it seems on the surface. It is actually about truffles. What's so it called? Sad Boy Truffle? Savoy, S-A-V-O-Y. Oh. Am I saying Savoy or Savoy? Savoy. Savoy. So we that's the French, French way of, uh, yeah, that's our French <laughs> that's way of saying That's a lot it. more gentlemanly if you say it that right. way. <laughs> okay, and uh, off the White Album. So shout out the Beatles again for making it topical. Two more. What was the first ever rap single? To hit the Billboard Top 40 charts. First, Is that the Grandmaster Flash? Um, I, no, I'm, draw, I'm drawing a blank at the name of the song, but it, uh, close to the edge. That's the song. I just can't even think of the <laughs> okay. name. I just can't. It's something hustle. Okay. Something hustle? I don't remember. But I was, Solid. I the first artist. rap single? The first rap single to ever hit the charts. Top 40. Like, what era do you think this is going to happen, Joe? Like, 90s? Early 80s. Oh, early 80s. Early 80s. Yep, this is, this is... is it, I, I'm pretty sure it's Grandmaster Flash. I just can't think of the title. No clue. Something I, like I know none of these answers, so... Okay. That's okay. That, that's usually me in, in the other seat every single week, so I, I empathize with you. The answer is Rapper's Delight that's it. by the Sugar Hill Gang. And you that were so wrong. close, Joe. But that's I think one. Grandmaster Flash was number two. It must okay. have been. Okay. 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 Cool, cool. Okay, last one. This one, I think we're going to have an answer to because I, I think Joe at least knows this one. Which guitar icon's mom was a designer for the likes of John Lennon, Ringo Starr, David Bowie, and Linda Ronstadt? Mom, guitar player's mom. Guitar player's mom was a designer for those people. Damn. And I think um, I'm having a new moon or some sort of solar eclipse happening on me, by the way. So just ignore <laughs> that and we'll get the answer. <laughs> can, well, uh, can I have uh, another hint? Maybe uh, in terms of narrowing down the guitar player, maybe. Okay. I, and I'll repeat the question too. So yeah, this, this, this guitar icon's mom was a designer for John Lennon, Ringo Starr, and David Bowie. And this is a, let's put him in the, like the 90s iconic guitar. He's oh. one of the more, he's not a super, super old guy. Still doesn't know what it down. Oh my okay. God. Uh, something I don't know. Uh, tough. I don't know. I'm just, because I saw a picture and I believe in serendipity sometimes. I saw a picture before we started. Is it Jerry Cantrell? Okay. No. Final answer? Yeah. Okay. I guess I can give it up. The answer is Slash. Oh, <gasps> Slash. Damn. Slash his mom, a big time designer, wow. and that was part of what brought him into the whole music world. He'd have David Bowie walking around his house when he was six, seven years old, and he actually ended up having a relationship with Slash's mother. So very interesting uh, stuff. And I, yeah, I didn't cool. take it too easy though, and, and I know that it, it was Bro, tough. You gave but, us yeah. no, you gave us no options. You gave us <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Basically, you just worded like confusing sentences. You just gave us confusing <laughs> sentences, and you expected us to know it in the back of my. I felt like I was back in math Dude. class. And, and none of these and, are real trivia ten. questions. I made these all up, by the way. I so. felt like I was straight <laughs> up <laughs> answering a math equation. That's what I felt like. So didn't do too well at that. Didn't do too well at this. So let's go. Let's That's move okay. on, please. I'm scared. Well, I'm scared. Yeah, I'm, I'm scared of on this day now. I am honestly scared. Jesus, let's get out of oh, here. All right, on this day. <laughs> on this day, 29th of October, 19th. Actually, we have a lot of on this day because I felt like there was a lot of interesting things that happened. Um, here you go. 29th of October, 1971. Dwayne Allman of the Allman Brothers Band was killed when he lost control of his motorcycle mm. on a Mackin or Macon, Georgia Street. Uh, while trying to swerve to avoid a tractor trailer and was thrown from the motorcycle. The details wow. are pretty gruesome as to how, what happened to him next, but you can imagine it wasn't good. Um, he was three weeks shy of his 25th birthday. So wow. obviously the Allman Brothers Band are uh, iconic. It's, uh, it was a sad death for the Dwayne Allman. And 29th of October, 1983, Pink Floyd's The Dark Side of the Moon marked its 491st week on the Billboard album chart in the U.S., surpassing the previous record holder, Johnny's Greatest Hits by Johnny Mathis, when it finally fell off of uh, the list in October 1988, uh, The Dark Side had set a record for 741 weeks on the chart. Oof. And it's still going. So that's uh, five years. <laughs> it's still Dude. going. It's still going. Jesus. That is insane. And just a little tidbit, I saw a Roger Waters solo concert five years ago 
yesterday. So that is that is a little thematic with the on this day theme. So shout out to Pink Floyd. 29th of October, 2003. So moving up here. Uh, research. Yeah, this, is, this, one's, uh, this one's wacky. Research in the U.S. found that songs get stuck in our heads because they create a brain itch that can only be scratched by repeating a tune over and over. Songs such as the Village People's YMCA and the Baja Men's <laughs> Who Let the Dogs Out owe their success to their ability to create a cognitive itch, according to Professor James Kilaris of the University of Cincinnati. Look Insane. at that. Tapping it's into uh, the people's brains with repetitive tunes. Interesting. It's interesting that you said that because uh, we put up a poll yesterday on Sam Mojo asking, what song do you think is going to be famous in 100 years? And somebody wrote that they happened to hear uh, Cotton Eye Joe being blasted out of oh, somebody's yeah. car. And I was like, I, re I keep, that's an itch for me. Every once in a while, it just comes out that whole chorus when you just start mimicking it. Yep. So yeah, it's interesting. Absolutely. Sweet Caroline, there's a number of those. That's yeah. interesting. Two more. 29th of October, 2007, Walk the Line, of course, the film about the life of singer Johnny Cash, um, acted by Joaquin Phoenix, and Reese Witherspoon was in that as well, of course. Um, where are we going here? His wife. Has uh, voted the most. Uh, stars and one of the actress. An Oscar in 2006. It was followed by rapper Eminem's 8 Mile uh, with Mozart's life story Amadeus next and Ray starring Jamie Foxx as musician musician Ray Charles at number four. I mm. think I just added this one here because it'd be cool to see another. Was there a recent movie of a musician? There's always. There's always. Was like, there one uh, recently? I feel like, I mean, I'm terrible with knowing. Within the past movie. decade, they did Dylan. Yeah, there Bob was a Elton John, right? There was a Freddie Mercury. Yes. With Bohemian Queen, yes. Oh, right. That one. Yeah. 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 There's a yeah. bunch. So this I was feel like those do well. Greatest music biopic in a poll. Huh. It's, it is good, man. It is good. Like yeah. I've only no, watched no, that it one once. I'll be honest, but good. like it is really good. Yeah, yeah. I watched that. I remember watching it when I was when I was younger. I didn't know it was actually Walking Phoenix until I got older. Uh, that one was that was a good movie. He did yeah. not want to do that movie, by the way. He almost didn't take the role apparently because he felt like he couldn't do it justice. So uh, interesting to see <laughs> that that was one of the most beloved biopics. I think, I think he did it more than justice, man. So I hear. <laughs> Last one here. I think, sorry, I think Joaquin Phoenix is kind of like one of those actors who kind of downplays his his ability, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. How could you? <laughs> Good in everything. 100%. Good in everything. To the, uh, 29th of October, 2009. Last one for you guys. Forbes magazine reported that Michael Jackson had earned about $72 million since his death on June 25th. <laughs> that was good enough for third place. Only third place, you think, with all that money. On their list of dead celebrities making the most money. Weird list. Maybe Watch Mojo can get in on that. A lot of money there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Top no, posthumous Fa earnings. Fashion design. That's, that's sick of me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's sick. <laughs> fashion designer Yves Saint Laurent came in first at $350 million. Oh, wow. Songwriters Richard Rodgers and Oscar Hammerstein were second with $235 million, And Elvis Presley was fourth, earning $55 million upon his death. My, I wonder, I wonder oh my. who those two are. I who were those like, two guys that wrote those songs? Yeah. I wonder, like, if uh, if this was, like, like you know, pre-streaming era, if, like, Michael Jackson would have had even more sales because people would have gone out and buy uh, records and stuff. I think it was definitely because when he released that that first posthum posthumous record, I think the only option was buying it on iTunes. So yeah, I think the sales would have been much higher. And, and interesting to see on the songwriting perspective because obviously those last two guys, two names that I would venture to say we probably know a lot of their music without knowing it's them. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that yeah. sort of goes with the theme of today's episode, which I think we're okay to move into. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Sweet. So as we mentioned off the top, Kevin Ross. Um, and, you know, we're going to come back with some takeaways afterwards, but definitely a guy who has no shortage of knowledge about this business. Um, he made a lot of points that were eye opening to me personally in terms of how things work, how things operate, how long it takes for placements to go through and what exactly the differences are between being a songwriter producer and being an actual artist. He bridges both of those gaps. It was very interesting to chat with him. And for any artists watching this who are up and coming, really important, I think, because I think, you know, from where I'm sitting, the more you learn about your business, the more well versed you are, the better you're going to do in this business. Uh, so let's hear from an artist who started in an unorthodox way and made his way to the top and then we'll be back with some takeaways
Kevin Ross, thanks for joining me on Inner Sleeve. Hey, man, I appreciate it, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, 100%. I know we got the uh, the most recent single, Looking for Love, with the video, which we're going to get into. Um, yeah. But the first thing I wanted to bring up, though, which I think is a really cool way that you interact with your fans on Instagram, is your mashup videos. I, uh, yeah. just, I'm wondering if we could start with maybe a description of that. Oh, uh, yeah, man. Mashup videos, they're just really kind of like tools of nostalgia. I think that's the best way to kind of explain it. It's like, you know, it allows for me to stretch out musically. It allows for me to practice and exercise my vocals and harmony skills and all that stuff. So it it, it kind of checks a lot of boxes as it pertains to like the mashup world and just the format. And it's also different, like because even when I was signed to as a, as a major act, um, I was still moving like an indie. I was still grinding like an indie. Um, you know, I wasn't I, I wasn't relying on uh, major label dollars to. You know what I mean? Like make this big explosion. So it's, it, it is very gratifying in a sense where like all of my 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 numbers and my fans are, are organic. You know what I mean? Mm. So which is a, which is an awesome thing. And it's very interesting how people may know me. Some people may know me more from the mashups than they do my actual artistry. Uh, but mm. it is an extension of me. So I can't feel a certain type of way if uh, you know what I mean, if, if, if that's where they know me from. So. It's, it's a cool extension that I have. So you feel like you've retained a lot of that indie mindset in terms of reaching people yourself and, and not relying on that, that corporation, so to speak. Yeah. Cause honestly, when I, when I first got into the, to the industry, that was, that was really what it was about in the sense of what could the major labels do for you? How could they blow you up? You know, you provide the talent, they give you, you know, the expansion. And I came in during a time where that wasn't the case. It was kind of like, it was right at the cusp of like, yeah, you need to do it yourself. Like if you mm. can't get yourself to a certain point, then we can't, we can't help you anyways. You know what I mean? So right. it was like the, the, the end of the old guard in a sense, and just the old way of doing things. I was right at that point where it was like, I had seen everybody from the olden days, you know, be taken from literally, you know, just kind of nowhere. You know what I mean? Obscurity. Mm. And to be this this name because of this gift and this talent that you had. And that just wasn't the case with my generation and with the class that was coming in with me. We had to put in the work. And so uh, it was a shock to a lot of us. And hence, a lot of us, um, well, there's very few of us left. And let's just say that. Mm. And so, um, Interesting. With, with, yeah. So with all that to be said, you know, it was, it was a huge like adjustment. And, you know what I mean? In that sense. So, you know, that was the mindset. Just move indie. It felt like we were moving indie. So, you know, keeping that mindset, it was like, well, shoot, if I feel like I'm moving indie, I might as well retain, you know what I mean? The majority of my rights uh, since right. I'm doing a lot of the, the legwork. And so, you know, hence why, you know, I kind of moved in the direction that I did. That's fascinating. So how many yeah. years were you actually indie, uh, like legit indie before you ended up signing? I never, I never released anything uh, prior to like, a, you know, major label. So it was like, you know, MySpace didn't count. It was like, hmm. you're just putting up songs. You know what I mean? Uh, I wasn't refined. It was just like, you know, just songs that I was working on. So I never put out a project as an independent prior to that. So I would, like I said, I was in the old mentality that it was like, all I got to do is get signed. All I got to do is get mm. signed to a label and then they'll take care of the rest. You know what I mean? Right. Like I provide the songs, they provide their services and we on and popping. And it, it, mm. didn't, it, didn't, it, didn't, it didn't end up like that. <laughs> so, cause it's a, it's a completely different game now. It sounds yeah. like. Yes. Yeah, a completely different game. Now it's normalized. But during mm. the time that I came in, 20, 2011, 2012, it was like, what in the world is going on? Like, that's when you started to see your Frank Oceans and the weekends and like all of these people started to then pop up and rise up, you know what I mean, from obscurity on their own brand, on their own merit. Yeah. By that time, you know, now granted, I mean, well, Frank, Frank was already in, he was in a, he was in a deal, right? With, with Def Jam, mm -hmm. we just didn't know, right? But all I have to mm -hmm. say is that now these artists are starting to understand what took me a couple of years later to understand is the fact that it's like, if you want something done, get it done on your own terms, get it done. Even if it means using your own money, even if it means like 
whatever it takes, you know? And so that was the mentality that kind of clicked in. Now, here's the thing. If I'm spending my money, uh, then I, 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 I want to see the fruit of my labor. And, yeah. you know, when major labels at the time, you know, the deals was like 80, 20, and 80 was going towards them. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, you know, that's a, that's a, a, a better, a better end of a deal when the label's taking 80 and you're taking 20. Right. Wow. So I'm like, okay, well, if y'all take 80% and you own a hundred percent of my masters and I'm paying money out of my own pocket to do this and that and to move around, it, it make it make sense. Right. Mm-hmm. So I was just like, you know what? I got to ask for my release. And even though it took me, it took, it took like a year and a half, two years in order for, for that release to be acknowledged and for them to give that to me. It was the wow. best thing that I could have ever, could have ever done just because of the landscape that we're in now. It's, it's just so much more rewarding, you know what I mean? Mm. To like get it done, you know, the way that you want to. So looking back, that was definitely the move that, that you feel was right and that you're benef- benefiting from the most now. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I think as as human nature, you you think sometimes of what could be and what could happen and this, this and that. But it's kind of like uh, you know, someone shows you their cards, you know, and shows you who they are and what what they are willing to do and what they're not willing to do. Um, believe them. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, take believe their word them. for it. Yeah, take their word for it. So they actually showed you that they don't care too much about you believe that and so once i got that you know it only took it only took my debut and an ep for me to realize okay these these aren't the these aren't the people that i need to do business with because they don't Mm. really understand they don't get it so i needed to separate myself just because you know something may look good or something may like feel like momentum is happening and from the outside it may look amazing you know, on a personal level, if you're not happy and not whole with it, it's like, what does it all mean? So, yeah, independence yeah. was the best thing. It's, it, you know, it's, it's more difficult. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's a lot more expensive. Uh, but the the reward in the sense of the knowledge, I mean, of course, you know, just like uh, being able to have the freedom to release music whenever you want to really be methodical with it, be thoughtful with it, um, to learn those lessons, you know, without groups of people telling you what you should and should not do and why this worked and why it didn't work and how we can, you know, so mm-hmm. it's, it's just, it is, it's much better for me, man. Much better. Do you feel like you learn more about the business from doing things firsthand or more from researching and listening to other people? Like which part do you feel like clicked the most for you? Or was it maybe a mixture of both? Uh, I'm definitely a crash dummy for sure. So me getting my hands dirty and like slam, like running up against the wall, you know, I learned the most valuable lessons from the most like unnecessary uh, mm. experiences sometimes. Fair like enough. Even if, yeah. Even if the knowledge is like, it's there and it's like, okay, all you got to do is just type in Google. It's like, you know what? I'm going to go with my instinct. And right. Sometimes your instinct is all the way wrong. You'd be like, you know what? Lesson learned. I, <laughs> <laughs> I learned True the enough. hard way, but it's, but it sticks with you. It sticks with you. And, and um, you know, it allows for you to, you know, it tests out your resilience too. You know what I mean? And just how much you actually can endure, you know, as a creative and as just as a human being as well. <laughs> yeah, all around. So, yeah. so at what point did the music really creep in for you? Um, was it at a really young age? And do you kind of remember that? Or is it something that was just always sort of instilled in you since you can remember? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think it was just more so like, music was just all always in, in the household, always in the household. Like the crazy thing is I literally remember the first song that I, that I heard and it was called uh, Been Around the World by, uh, dang, I forget this lady's name now. I remember her name. Uh, Been Around the World and I, 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 I. Uh, I wish I knew the, the original. I know the Diddy version, that's about it. <laughs> yeah, it was like, yeah, I forget, I forget the lady's name, but that I remember that being like the the first song like to ever like seep into my to seep, seep into my brain. So that was like early nineties, mm. as like a as an infant, like in the in the car seat, just like you know taking in taking in the world. So um, yeah, it's it's kind of been. I mean, of course, obviously a soundtrack, but everybody 
you know what I mean? Like uses music as a soundtrack. It just, as I got older, I didn't know how much of a, a vehicle it would be for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. In particular, you know, like the, you know, it started as something where it's like, it was just, you know, something that played around the house to something that I like to do to something that I love to do then to something that I made a career out of, you know, but that's just mm. the process. But yeah, as, as a kid, it's always been around. So it's always kind of been infused in my life. And Washington, D.C., is that where you grew up? Yes. Washington, D.C. is where I grew up, born and raised. Yep. Very cool. I feel like that's a very um, artistic city. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would imagine there's music and art pretty much in most places. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a very, uh, it not only was it musical and art and artistic, um, it was the entrepreneurial spirit within mm. the city. Everybody wanted to have their own business, whether it's a clothing brand, a production, you know, company, a food, you know, shop, whatever it was. Like just the entrepreneurial spirit within the city was really, really big, massive. And we were, as a city, we supported that. And the things that we did like, we championed that. And so uh, we took pride in everything that came from D.C., everything that was original. It was just our own flavor, our own flair, our own slang, our own, you know, everything, sound. Um, you know, so that that carries that carries with me to this day, just the uniqueness of you mm. know, the city that I'm from. Do you feel like it, it did have a big, big influence on your music, though? Because, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it must be hard to hard to avoid. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely had a, a big influence on my music. I think people people underestimate how much of DC is in today's music. You know, one of Beyonce's mm -hmm. biggest songs is "Crazy in Love," and it and it's a it's a go go feel, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> you know. So, um, but then there's another one, and this is the route that I took um, because it's also a history lesson for those who don't know um, that Washington DC created this format called Quiet Storm, which we know as adult R and B. And so I've been used to hearing Quiet Storm and adult R&B since I was a child. So it was normal for me to be caught within the, you know, the old music, 60s, 70s, 80s, you know what I mean? Uh, growing up with that. And then, you know, on the flip side, on a more like mainstream, it was, you know, Bad Boy. It was, you know what I mean? Early 2000s, Nelly and Cash Money and all that. So all of that was my my world but it was like the mainstream was daytime and then at night everybody listened to quiet storm it was just like mm. a nor it was like a normal thing um for for the city and so i wanted to give a nod to that so that's why a lot of the music that i created from long song away was an adult r&b record but it to me it it never was about the format more so than it was the feeling about you know my city and so right. I, instead of me going the go-go route, I decided to go the quiet song route, which is a format that, that we created at um, Howard University Radio. Hmm. Why do you think the term quiet storm never caught on as much as adult R&B? You know, I think that quiet storm was more so like a, like a radio programming in a sense okay. where it's like, this is the quiet storm hour. Right, because Smokey mm. Robinson in the late seventies, early eighties had a song called "Quiet Storm," and so it embodied everything that the the format would become. Right, it had these very like lush chords, and you know, it's very like subtle, sensual kind of, it was very warm feeling. And so uh, they they took that that concept, that name, and then branded it into a programming, and then "Quiet Storm" then you know, evolved into them saying, well, it can be R&B because this is mainstream R&B. So what do we call it? It's called oh, okay. adult R&B. Let's, you know, or urban AC. Now it's adult R&B. Now they're changing it to now R&B because, you know, thanks to the major labels, which I actually, it works to, to my advantage. Uh, but major labels now, since a lot of them can't get a number one at mainstream hip hop, you know, or mainstream, you know, just mainstream urban, they're just like, well, take off adult R&B because we don't want for our young artists to feel old. Let's just make mm. it the R&B chart. And it's right, like, okay, right. So because at the end of the day, they're going to use their dollars to say, we got a number one. No one's going to ask where they got the number one. 
But as long as you hit number one, that's all that matters. As long as you're number one yep. somewhere, that begins the conversation. So it's very interesting in how that genre from the quiet storm to urban AC to adult R&B to now R&B now has changed because of the perception of it and their mm. need to have, you know, a number one and to make it legitified and to make it sound and look cool. Sort of by any means me. on, on their side. Yeah, but it works for you yeah. and, and many other <laughs> artists, right? <laughs> yeah, listen, I'm sitting on number 15 on the Billboard R&B chart. So thanks to them. <laughs> hey, man, hats off. That, that's incredible. Thank seriously. You. Yes, uh, sir. You know, I want to know about your time in uh, performing arts school. And I know yeah. that you ended up going from that to Berkeley. H how did that school experience prepare you uh, for Berkeley? Um, it allowed for me to transform. It allowed okay. for me to become a, not even become a different person, but to, to be me authentically. Mm -hmm. I think in grade school, I was very quiet and reserved because I just didn't have a place where people understood me i didn't have a home i didn't have you know what i mean like a lot of people to relate to in that way um okay. so i just kind of kept to myself um and you know i would you know i would speak i was cordial but it was just i was very soft-spoken quiet to myself meek yeah and that's what people knew me for you know so when the opportunity to go to an art school came about i was like this is it if I'm going to be me and if I'm going to break out of this shell that honestly I had pegged myself into and I couldn't I, I couldn't seem to find a way out of it. Um, this is it. This is it. This right. is my ticket. And and Ellington was that it was literally that for me to say, you can sing, be around people that can sing. You could do this and be around people that can do that and don't hold back. Give mm. everything that you got, even if it feels weird, even if it feels awkward. I remember going to a, a um, like a camp. They had a camp before we went to school and it was to, you know, get all of the freshmen acclimated. And I was just like, I'm going to be so far away from all the people that know me. And I was mm. just like uber excited about that. That It was, but it was like, a good thing. Like, yeah, it was like I have a new identity. Like it's a blank, you know, it's a blank canvas. Right. Mm. So I'm like, all right, cool. So. We get to the camp. Now, at this time, I'm rapping and singing. Don't even okay. ask, but I'm rapping <laughs> and singing. <laughs> and they bust out into like this freestyle session. So I'm like, it's my time. Let's go. I'm flowing and rapping. And everybody like, oh. Then someone amidst the circle or the cypher is like, I didn't even know Cam could do that. And I was like, <laughs> who from my past is here? And they were just like, yo, I didn't know that you could do that and you could sing and rap and this, this, and that, and yada, yada, yada. But, you know, <laughs> I was just like, listen, I've committed to this. So if it's one or two people that, that are here with me at this high school, so be it. But it gave me the opportunity to really live like in my, in my true skin. And mm -hmm. then that allowed for me to then go on to Berkeley where I could then go deeper into music to say, I, I know that I love music. I know that I have a great appreciation for it. Now it's time for Berkeley to help me to figure out where do I belong in mm. this music sphere? Um, what can I contribute to it? You know what I mean? And I think yeah. that was what Berkeley was about for sure. That's funny, though, that there was a couple familiar faces that sort of started coming out of the woodwork. But at that point, you had already seemed to have gotten some of that confidence of, of reinventing yeah. yourself. Yeah. yeah. Man, that's that's yeah, so nice. crazy. How do you exactly break into the world of songwriting? Because um, mm. that, that's something that that's really fascinates me. Yeah, um, breaking into songwriting. I mean, it was just, it, honestly, it was through need. I didn't know any other songwriters outside of myself, right? I knew people that yeah. rap. I didn't know anyone that wrote songs. And right. so it was just, I had these songs in my heart and I'm just going to write them for better or for worse, no matter how bad I think they are. And so, uh, you know, as... 
as I grew and as I met other writers, you know, my, my style started to change, listening to other writers and meeting mentors and stuff like that, you know, it just kind of changes the way that you create. Then uh, by the time that I had left Berk or by the time I was leaving Berkeley, I knew that the way in was through writing. I didn't know too many people, um, but I, I knew that I was like, you know what? I kind of like writing. I kind of like hearing people sing my songs. This sounds, this, this is cool. Like, let me, let me, let me focus here. You know, I knew yeah. I could sing, but I was just like, you know, nobody's giving me a deal yet. Nothing's made sense. So for the time being, I'm all right. Like, I'm going to, you know, see, see where it leads me. And so, um, you know, honestly, it started from just like working on collaborating with people in Atlanta. And, you know, as many producers and other writers as, as possible until, you know, you, you find something that people are interested in and you use that momentum, whether it's a crack in the door, you put your toe, you put your foot in the door and you keep delivering more songs until, uh, you know, somebody on the other side says, hey, there's something here, or, you know, says, yes, I'm, I'm going to cut it. Um, and that, that first placement for me when I got down to Atlanta was with Jamie Foxx. And, um, I, we had, I think we had, we wrote that song maybe, you know, like nine months prior to him cutting it. And wow. so that's a long time <laughs> to be yeah. sitting and waiting. So, you know, now, now I'm, honestly, after, after two weeks, you just think, you know, he's not going like to use it. it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> take a hint, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what, that's what you, a rational mind would think. Right. But because yeah. I mean, you're just doing what, what makes the most sense or thinking yeah. what makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. So why did it take so, nine months? Do you think, is he just very uh, meticulous about his stuff? Uh, the way Jamie explained it, he explained it to us. He was just like, um, he said, you know, it's kind of like, you know, when you're gathering things and you and you got a bag full of stuff and you're just collecting and collecting and collecting, he said, you know, some some things will drop out the bag and you know sometimes you got to look behind and see what you left and when you pick it up and see what you actually have. <laughs> I said, oh, I, said, I understand. It was just the overflow of stuff, you know. Remember, like the album that I was on was the same album that Drake was on. Drake wrote "Fall for Your Type," right? So, right, you know, it's all of this new energy coming in, including myself. That's like okay like drake is the hottest thing at this point now too so he's like i need as many songs from drake give me give me give me give, right. me, give me and the song that we had was just very clubbish and but very unique in a sense and once he heard it and he probably played it for a couple of women and it was like i like this one and he was like well this is the one we're gonna cut and mm. and and there you have it so sometimes sometimes it'll take <laughs> i've had songs that plays years after the creation wow. of it years so you know and I, I mean yeah you know some, sometimes it sometimes it takes that long so you can't take it personal you can't be like man i know this is a hit and i'm not making no more records until someone cuts it it's like you're mm. literally like cut yourself short because of the fact of like yeah it's good but maybe it hasn't reached the right person yet keep going keep mm. moving and that helps to create momentum so that you know, when people see it from the outside looking in, it's like, oh man, such and such has hit after hit after hit. And it's like, no, nah, it's not like we're going into the studio and just cranking out hits. Sometimes right. it's the catalog in a sense to say, wait, you know, so you did this. I got one of your records. Matter of fact, this is actually amazing. It's like, oh, it's amazing now because of what I've done for this person. It's amazing mm. because I have a name, but because you know but that's the the name of the game and that's the industry that we're in too is that you know people are enticed by your status your name mm -hmm. what you've done so they'll you know they may have songs you know in their catalog that you have submitted you know but until something hits and they like hey can we use such and such song and it's like i thought you didn't like it oh well oh well you know you know how it goes it's like yeah i do know how it goes like, yeah i definitely know how it goes <laughs> <laughs> you can't take it personal it's just it's the name of the game you know so you just you know you keep you keep your songs you're close to you send them off and you just never know when it when it when it'll hit so is that a challenge though like at, at given points to deal with still or are, are you just really used to it now uh i mean yeah i'm i'm human so like you know if you're working on something for 
you know, a week or two weeks or something like that. And, you know, you're like, man, I think I got it and this, this and that. And you don't hear a response. So they're like, nah, this ain't it. Or, nah, we've been going in another direction. You're like, oh, my God. Like, <laughs> sure, of course. <laughs> I, I'm not good. I thought I was good. <laughs> <laughs> Arrow through the heart here. <laughs> yeah, you know. So, you know, that's the that's the biggest thing with creatives, too, is just the fact of, you know, like, either keeping your ego in check or making sure that your ego is healthy enough to endure and to last as well. Uh, mm. to have some kind of self-worth so that's a constant battle that we as creatives have to face in a sense where it's like you don't want too much where you're not you're not able to see yourself anymore and you just become a monster but you don't want to have too little where you're easily defeated and, and you don't really see your full potential because of the fact that you let someone crush your ego because it was that fragile so mm. you got to find that fine balance <laughs> in yeah. between where it's like people may not understand it. Um, you know, some people may consider this being self-centered or um, arrogant. And it's like, no, it's not arrogant. It's confidence. You got to be confident in what you do. You know what I mean? Like you have your platform because of the fact that you're you're confident and you believe that you can, you know what I mean? Like get these names, to get these artists to, you know, to tell a story and to talk a hole in your head like like myself right now. But all I, I love it, say, dude. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's the confidence in order to say when you don't get that artist, when you don't get the one that you're really looking for to to wake up the next day and to say, okay, that artist not accepting my request doesn't make or break my platform. I'm yeah. still dope, and they and and they gonna have to come and see me eventually. You know what I mean? Hundred <laughs> percent. You can't let yourself yeah. become defined by that that outside. Uh, feedback and I've heard that about positive feedback too like I've heard don't get too invested in the positives as well yeah yeah which can be a major key uh, what was it like for you when you got your first number one on uh, the billboard R&B chart oh man okay so uh, the first number one I had was with Trey songs wow. as a writer yeah so money's different for sure. <laughs> oh, well yeah i guess that'd be a, a first change <laughs> yes yes uh, I'm, but honestly that change didn't come until nine months so right you know, okay wow so it'll it'll hit and then everybody goes you're number one how does it feel it's like i'm still broke I'm <laughs> <Yeah>. still <laughs> waiting on that check <laughs> <laughs> i'm still broke for the next nine months no one asks me for anything because i don't have it i promise you um wow. but so that's the thing and that's the fastest that's the i had the the fastest turnaround just imagine having a record to come out and then it's one of them slow burners and it don't really hit until a year later so now your process is now a year in nine months so that's two two years of waiting on the residual to come that's pretty so crazy is, yes yeah, it's, it's it's pretty crazy <laughs> that's how you hear stories about like you know when uh certain bands and stuff and they're like where were you at uh when you first heard your song on the radio and they was like yeah i was like sleeping in my car like i was yeah. on a park bench <laughs> <laughs> because it's not that that direct connection like people think <laughs> yes wow so, like, usually it happens when you're like damn near at like your lowest when you're like <laughs> you're like living with somebody else like in a basement or something you're just like I don't know. It's God help me, like figure it out. And then it's like <laughs> you're on the radio. How does it feel? It's like I'm still suffering, but I hope that this will manifest into something. Um, but yeah, wow. like nine months to a year later, you know, the check comes in and things change from there. Things change. You you know you 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 see better. You want better. You get better. You do better. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So that that's kind of what that number one was. It was gratifying. Um, it, it, you know, it took a level of focus. I, re yeah. I remember that process. I remember that process because I remember uh, it took him just saying, I like that record and him not cutting it <laughs> to, to be like, he likes it. Okay, we're in <laughs> here now. Let's go. You know, that's the, sometimes it could be, you know, mistaken as delusion. You know what I mean? Or mm. delusions of, grand, or, uh, what is it? Uh, delusion of grandeur. Yeah. 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 Delusions of grandeur. But for me, it was like, no, I, I see that slither of light to say he likes something. So I'm going to attack that. I'm going to really hone in. And it took, it took four months, four to five months of like really like every day, just like hacking it out. Like, okay, next song, uh, shitty mm -hmm. song after shitty song after okay song. Uh, until we got into a stride until like, 
March, April. It was like, once April got there, it was like, I knew when I wrote that, that number one, it was like, okay, this is something. I don't know what this is, but this is something. And uh, it just felt singular. It's, it felt like for the first time, it was like, no, I couldn't rely on no one else in the world to do what I just did. In a sense to say, yeah. I didn't think about what any other writer was doing. Because it was like, if they only knew what was happening in this room, you know what I mean? Like, then, you know, so it was just, it was a very surreal moment. But that's yeah. when I kind of knew that it was like, okay, this is the feeling. And then, you know, you just, you know, you keep, you keep going, you keep going and, and you know, figure it out from there. Man, see, I love this. And this is great info for for all the up and coming artists out there watching this. Um, curious about the new single, Looking for Love. I know there's also yeah. an awesome video. Uh, yeah. Definitely seem to be going into some different territory, maybe lyrically a little bit. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Um, I mean, Looking for Love, man, it's, it's, just a, it's a contemporary love story. I'll say that. Um, even though the track feels very, like, nostalgic, you know, it just has, like, these very, like, classic kind of vibes. Um, the, the, the big thing was making sure that I kind of told a story of what I was experiencing as far as within love in the sense of like, we are 10 years repressed in our generation where like our parents, you know, they were having kids and getting married in their twenties, like early twenties at that. Um, and for us, it's like in our mid twenties, you know, late twenties and thirties, we're still figuring it out for ourselves. So it's like, how could we get involved with a new one if we're still trying to get our thing off the ground right and for then sure. now we have options more than ever so it's like it's hard for people to settle down because we just have so many different options and opportunities in front of us so looking for love was just more so just a perspective to say hey you know for someone who is ready for love um i'm i'm here waiting you know and it's, mm. it's yet another testament to patience and understanding you know what i mean so that's, you know, that's all that was. Very cool. And we're going to leave a link for everybody to watch that video. And of course, find Kevin everywhere else in the description. But thanks so much for your time, man. This has honestly been a really eye-opening chat. And uh, I know people are going to get a lot out of this. Man, hopefully so, man. I appreciate it. Thank you once again. If you're ready, don't give for love. Oh, oh, oh. lady, you know it's right here. It'll go when you open up. Yeah. Till then, we'll keep in touch. Keep in touch. You know the number. We'll keep in touch. Huge thanks to Kevin Ross for coming on the show and sharing his expertise in the business. You know, I think I mentioned this leading into the interview, but definitely was mind blowing for me to know how long it takes for some of these song placements to go through. I mean, you mentioned with Jamie Foxx, almost two years until he got word on whether or not his track was even gonna be used, guys. So it's like, it really just shows how intensive some of this process can be. Oh yeah, I've spoken with session musicians that have played on some major releases, like we're talking about like a bass player that played on uh, Buble, Michael Buble release or something. And and like when I asked, oh, you played on this song that, you know, and the guy's like, I did. Oh, I didn't know that they ended up keeping <laughs> the tracks, you know, like, cause they, mm. these guys get hired for sessions and, and they're never told, yeah, we kept your tracks or yeah, we used your tracks, you know? So yeah, it takes a long time, man. Surprisingly sometimes. Yeah, he seemed very soft-spoken. Kevin he Ross. was, I don't know. you know, and, and he's a guy who's very much focused. He's also very focused on being interactive on social media, like we mentioned off the top of the interview. And if you guys haven't seen that, make sure to check out Kevin Ross on Instagram. Um, the different methods that he uses to stay connected and do mashups where he's layering harmonies. I mean, to be able to do such singing like that with no editing whatsoever, no vocal S production is is really, really huge. So smooth. His voice is just so like smooth. I got a bit of like the weekend Bruno Mars. Like, I don't know, something mm -hmm. like- In terms of yeah the tone yeah but definitely tone. A different yeah yeah definitely a different vibe i loved like um i love that he was super honest like yeah i'm number one but you know where's my money you know like he still didn't get paid it takes a while that too to get collect on your uh on on, on a number one or something like that you know so it, the, by the time the royals royalties sorry kick in mm. um i also really liked the his uh quiet storm he was talking about like um how it became r&b is kind of a bit of a nice 
like lesson on that. That I enjoyed that seeing sort of like behind the curtain on that stuff, you know. Yeah, it's really interesting because you know he he's constantly evolving and, and sort of I think he lets the story write itself the way it, it it will. Like he doesn't want to get in the way of how things are going. He sort of moves with the flow, which is something that's really interesting about him and. And it's like, cause we, we, as artists, you know, like we all think this is the song you always, your latest is your, always your greatest kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But it's like, he did mention that it's like, it's all about the body of work. So it's how much yeah. stuff you have out there. So obviously it's like anything else, right? The more you have out, the bigger the net you ca cast, the, the more chances you have of reeling in a fish or someone who's interested in the song. So if you have a hundred songs, you have a lot better chances than one, two or three, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Great points and uh, really happy that we ha got to have Kevin on. And thank you guys for tuning in to this brand new episode of Inner Sleeve. We're back here every single week with a brand new guest, sometimes even two guests. Um, if you're tapped in with us on YouTube, make sure to click that subscribe button. And when you do, click that little notification bell right next to it to get real-time updates about Sound Mojo. We're posting polls, community tabs, basically anything we can think of to have you guys tell us what you want to see. We're going to listen to that. And trust me, we do listen. Um, so thanks so much for tuning in. Also, make sure to follow us on all social media at Sound Mojo. That's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok. Am I missing anything, guys? Or does that wrap it up for episode Road 45? to 25K. Yes, yep. Road to 25. And Road to out. episode 50. That's there. right. Yeah. This is cool. We're going to have to all rock the merchandise for episode number 50. Um, and if you want to wear it along with us, make sure to go check that out as well. The link is in the description below. It's sweater weather, it's hoodie weather, and yeah. why not get dressed up in style with Sound Mojo? So make sure to go check us out. Thanks so much for tuning in. Until next time, we'll catch you guys right back here on Inner Sleeve.